episode 28 of Give That Fan a Podcast. Welcome to everybody listening. Paul, how you doing, man? I'm doing all right, man. I'm doing all right. How are you? I can't complain. My my cats, my new cat is finally back to full health. Oh, nice. We've acclimated them to the other cats. They seem to be getting along okay. There's a little bit of fighting, but also a lot of grooming. I don't know. It's 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 been fun. I have three cats now. I lit a, uh, a a pumpkin spice candle in the laundry room where we have their litter box today, and then one of the cats took a dump, and now the apartment smells like pumpkin spice poop. So it's uh, we're doing great. Nice. There's uh, there's not a whole lot going on. It's been three weeks since we've done an episode. We hope everybody enjoyed their Thanksgiving holidays. Um, like I said, not a ton going on. We are live on YouTube.com slash at Give That Fan a Podcast. We're live on Facebook on the Orioles twenty four seven page. As well as at Orioles fan problems, Orioles fan probs on Twitter. I forgot to set up my screen here so that I can see my notes and do the show at the same time. That's not helpful. Let me adjust a little bit. And Paul, I, I'm working on a project that you will be involved in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to host it. It's going to happen right here on Give That Fan a Podcast. It is called Orioles Podcast feud it's a project i'm very very excited about we'll get us started after the winter meetings it's going to be a family feud style orioles i've been calling it a trivia ish game because the survey questions it's it's a lot of trivia but it's also a lot of just orioles related things i guess i could say uh but it's it's a project i'm very excited about uh it's going to be between a bunch of other orioles podcasts including yours with uh zach goodman the bat around which is live every saturday morning I've been a, a co-host on that for you guys a few times. It's a lot yeah. of fun. And I, I figured with, with this kind of project, we only really need one person to host it, but I wanted to keep you involved. And so I, I'm glad that you and Zach are going to represent your own show. Uh, everyone else, your, your favorite show is probably going to be uh, involved. Um, I crowdsourced answers to like 70 survey questions, put them all together on a PowerPoint. We have a logo, the game board. Actually, I'm going to show you guys the game board because I have a little preview. Let me see if I can uh, present my screen here. I'm very excited about this. I put a lot of work into it, and I think it's it's pretty sick. Does it feel good when you do a project and it comes out the way you want it to? Oh yeah, I, like I thought I would. It's a lot of questions, and it was it was a lot of doing the same thing for uh, different different survey questions. But I, I never got tired of it, which is, is how I know I, I'm I'm gonna have a lot of fun with this. So let's share this. Check that out. Nice. That what do you great. think? Yeah, it looks great. It looks like one of the. Uh, it looks like the um, Family Feud app that was on the uh, uh, on phones for a little bit there that people were playing not too long ago. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the idea. So uh, it, I'm not going to reveal obviously any of the uh, the the answers or the question because I, I want that all to be a surprise. But sure. check us out when you when you get a question wrong. Yeah, that's right. Is it going to do it? There it is. Oil bird pops out. Did you get the audio on that or no? I did not get the audio on that. All right, I will. I'll have to sort that out. But uh, yeah, it's 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 going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited about it. So, so that's a little you, preview of the board. What are you going to do when my show wins? And, <laughs> and then everyone's like, calling for collusion. Yeah, because so Zach asked me. Um, Zach had a trivia question for me the la- on the last episode of the Bat Around. Because during the off season, we do trivia to end the show. Or it's mm-hmm. one of the last segments of the show, that is to say. And um, he asked me if I could name all 12 of the Orioles' Roll 5 picks since the year 2000. And I got nine of them. And, like, huh. I was I was pretty shocked that I was able to get nine of them, but I got nine. And uh, That's impressive. Yeah, I, I, and I was like, man, nobody stands a chance in this uh, Orioles feud thing that we got going on here. <laughs> You're going to run the table, aren't you? I hope so, man. No, I, 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 I can't I, – I always pride myself as being like an Orioles historian of sorts. I'm sure there are people out there that know more than I do. I'm going to have a really hard time dealing with it when and if I lose. I, <laughs> I, I, like, that's like the thing I know more than most people. And so when, if somebody knows more than me, I'm going to be pretty upset about it. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's interesting that you bring up the Rule 5 because that would have been a great survey question for me to include. You know, name, name an Orioles Rule 5 pick from the last decade or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I did not include that one. So uh, if, if you already know that, I'm, I'm sorry, but you don't have a leg up, unfortunately. 
but uh, a lot of fun questions. Like I said, a, a lot of trivia, but also a lot of, you know, random Orioles questions that I, I won't give away, but uh, some that are really fun. You know, I've, I've shared it with some people. Uh, most of the people who answered the survey questions responded and said it was a lot of fun. It was very long. Obviously, 70 questions is a lot, um, but it, it seems like it's going to be really enjoyable. I hope it's going to bring some engagement. Uh, the shows will all be streamed live as our regular episodes are, although the Twitter, it, it'll go to our Give That Fan a Podcast Twitter as opposed to Orioles Fan Problems, only because I think this is going to be a good way to bring um, – I guess a lot of engagement to our page and to our show. Uh, like I said, it's, it's involving, it'll be a showdown between Orioles podcasts. So your, your favorite shows will, will probably be involved and uh, an eight team double elimination tournament. So the losers will only, if, if you lose twice, you're out, but you could play as many as four or five, six times if you keep winning. And so I, I really think it's going to be a lot of fun. I might even get a trophy for the winner. I, I, you, you think I should? I think that'd be cool. I, I finally got a take to rake trophy. Um, oh, did you? Yeah, and it's it, the the rake. Let me tell you that I sat here for like an hour making a rake out of um, uh, uh, toothpicks. Oh and my goodness! The rake head <laughs> looks fantastic, but then I attached it to I attached it to a Q-tip, and the the cotton on the Q-tip is coming off, and so the rake head is coming off. So I got to find a new rake stem. But the rest uh, of it, the rest of it is so is so cool because it's it's like an old Miguel Tejada Old Bay um, bobblehead. Uh yeah. It, where the bat was is now just where the rake goes, and it looked great the first day, but now the rake head is just like flopped to the side. So, <laughs> but I'm three time defending champion. By the way, I didn't get to tell you that. I uh, I thought that Zach was murdering me in take to rake all year, and. I think it was just because I'm so used to bludgeoning him in it that even though I was winning, it felt like I was losing because it was close all year. But I ended up beating him like 11 to 9 in wow. in, in um, Take the Rake. And you actually had one of the three guest wins of oh, the heck year. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I actually ended up winning Take the Rake in the regular season and in the postseason. So it was a clean sweep. And I'm now uh, 2020, 2021, 2022 three-time defending take to rake champion. Wow. I, I was going to ask, so you do it by the yearly standings, not because three, three weeks in a row would be impressive in and of itself, but that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, last, last time I, I co-hosted uh, with you, uh, we had uh, Luke, Luke Jackson mm-hmm. on the show mm-hmm. and um, you guys bullied me into picking Jordan Alvarez. I was going to go with uh, Alex Bregman and then Jordan in the playoffs had those two great games was was the hot ticket and then he forgot how to hit and Bregman was was really good that week. So I I had I had a chance there, but Jordan Jordan was the obvious pick. I had a Judge and I had Bryce Harper and it was a, the the week that Bryce Harper hit like four home runs. Yeah. So even with Judge's Judge went 1 for 7 with six strikeouts and a home run, but even with his 1 for 7 because of what Harper did I ended up winning and I I didn't lose once in the playoffs. So yeah, well, and, didn't and, I tell you that? Go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, didn't I tell you that despite Judge starting with like seven strikeouts and eight at bats, that he was gonna have his Yankee moment, and then the next game he had a three run homer. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. That's why. That's yeah. why I took him. Yeah, it worked out for you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so this Orioles podcast feud, very very excited about it. Um, I hope to do about two episodes per week, maybe three. It, it's gonna be tough to get everybody's schedules together because we need, you know, it's teams of two, so we'll have five people on at a time. Well, our little heads will be on the side as it was when I when I showed the uh, the board there a minute ago. But yeah, I'm, I'm pumped about this. I'm I'm excited that you and uh, Zach are participating and, and representing your show. Uh, but moving on, um, that'll start after the winter meetings. But before the winter meetings, there isn't really anything going on on the Orioles front. It's been a slow off season. The Orioles transaction log has been completely bare since they outrighted Mark Colesbury to AAA. That was on November 17th. So not a whole lot going on. That leaves them once again with Adley Rutschman as the only catcher on the 40 man. It's kind of weird because we had, he was the only catcher there for a while. And we claimed like four or five guys off waivers. The two Reds guys, uh, Cam Gallagher was on there, Ben Boom. Everyone on there has been either outrighted or released an elected free agency. Yeah. So Rutschman now is the only catcher on the 40 man. And uh, yeah, they I, I wanted six. to. They, I think they had six. Right? They had six, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I wanted to comment on something. I'm going to scroll ahead in my notes here. Um, A couple of Orioles minor leaguers who elected free agency. I'll give the full list later, but Brett Cumberland and Jacob Nottingham, those are two names that we talked about, Paul, as 
kind of being content with either of them as a potential backup catcher in 2023. Mm -hmm. Now they're both free agents. It looks like the front runner at this point is Anthony Bemboom, unless they go out and get somebody in free agency. Are you are you content with that, or, or would you prefer they go out and get somebody? Uh, yeah, I, I think that Ben Boom offers you more defensively than Robinson Torinos does. Um, the bat leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, uh, there's not anybody in-house that I'm okay with being the backup catcher, and I don't think the Orioles feel that way either. Uh, I fully expect them to go out and try and sign somebody. Um, I don't know who, but I fully expect them to go out and try, and try to sign somebody. Wouldn't it be awesome if it was a... Wilson Contreras, and he and Rutschman split time between DH and catcher, and that way you never have to have a bad catcher behind the dish. That would be yeah, that'd be fine with me. Yeah, but uh, if, not, if Contreras uh, is okay playing second fiddle, yeah, I mean, but what's going to end up happening is I think that they're going to go out and sign um, a veteran to like a, a a league minimum deal or a one year one point two million dollar deal to come in and be Adley's backup, and hopefully somebody that can swing the stick. The problem is, and we've talked about this on this show. And um, when Paul Moncano and Brandon, I can't remember Brandon's last name. Brandon Mortensen. Brandon Mortensen on um, Mass and All Access did their, did their free agency bracket. Um, and they were talking about backup catchers. Paul mentioned it also. You're not going to get a bat for, with your backup catcher. It's, it's just not going to happen because if they could hit, they wouldn't be a backup. So I'm really interested to see who they get. But I also want to, I'm interested to see the Birdland reaction because. I was pumped when they got Robinson Chirinos last year because to me it was like this is a major league signing. Um, knew that he wouldn't be much behind, uh, behind the plate or at the plate, but knew that he was going to offer a little bit of something. Um, I'm going to be interested to see how Birdland reacts when this catcher is good defensively but can't hit. Yeah. Uh, Paul and Brennan, by the way, will be representing Mass and All Access in our tournament. So oh, nice. I'm, I'm very, very thrilled that they'll be joining us for that as well. Um, I like those guys. So I'm going to have to take them down too. Yeah, I, I met him. I met them for the first time at uh, at Jimmy's. I don't remember what the event was, but it was it might have been like a draft night party or something. But uh, Paul came up and and introduced himself to me and was like, "Are you the Orioles fan props guy?" I was like, "Yeah." He goes, "I'm Paul Mancano. I, I work for Mass." And I was like, "Yeah, dude, I know who you are." Like, how's it going? <laughs> uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, Anthony Baboon Paul is. I, I think he's a fine backup. I, I'd rather them go out and get a veteran who can help you know, mentor Adley, whether or not Ad Adley even now, I think could be the mentor, but mm -hmm. I'd like to get a veteran back there. Ben Boom, I think is fine. And I think we'll realize he's a much better backup when he's backing up a guy like Rutschman than he is as a backup to starting catcher Robinson Chirinos. Yeah. Cause that's, that's just the poor solution at catcher. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see. Maybe the, maybe the battle play a little bit more. Um, I just, I don't expect they got any backups to hit, but I do expect him to hit better than what what did he hit in his little bit of time here, like one forty one, something like that. I, I it wasn't he, good. I don't even think he hit that high. I think it was more like one hundred three, but uh, hopefully the back the bat will play up. I hope so. Uh, one thing I do want to note, um, a minor transaction is uh, the retirement of outfield prospect Johnny Riser. Mm -hmm. um, he, he posted on Instagram he was added to the voluntarily retired list on November the tenth, I believe it was. He cited persistent back pain as his reason for stepping away from the game, which obviously a disappointing end. Uh, I think he's still 26 years old, might be 25. Um, he was seventh round pick out of TCU in 2019. Uh, he had his first professional home run, which was a bomb, by the way, off of Noah Syndergaard when, when Syndergaard was rehabbing in Aberdeen. And uh, he went viral in 2021. Paul, did you see his catch that he made? Do you remember this? He made a catch, basically hurtled the foul wall in left field. Uh, it, it was a Grayson Rodriguez start in Richmond. I think I remember this. Um, well, he, the this weird thing in, is the this catch was in 2021, right? 21, yeah. And the catch itself actually didn't count, I guess, because he, he landed in foul. He like he landed out of play before the ball hit the glove. I, I believe that's the reason why the catch didn't count. Oh, but yeah, it, it, it was wouldn't. a ridiculous catch anyway. It wouldn't if that were the case. You can leave your feet in 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 the ball the ballpark and catch the ball and land out of the ballpark. But if you hit the ground first and then catch the ball, it doesn't count. It, it was it was neck and neck, though. Like, he he landed and caught it right about the same time. But a ridiculous catch. Um, you know, he's a guy whose career I, I've enjoyed following personally. Uh, from a baseball standpoint, pretty low on the depth chart as far as future Orioles outfielders are concerned. But a talented guy. And and from a personal standpoint, obviously, we, we wish him the best with with whatever's next. In his yeah, it, it, it just sucks because he was just drafted in, what, 2019? Same draft yeah. as Rutschman, right? And yep. drafted in 2019 and 
three years later, his career is over because of chronic back pain. It just and, and I'm somebody who suffered some back injuries, nothing like over the top, um, but I've, I've pulled my back a time or two deadlifting and squatting, and it doesn't feel good, and it, it's, it's always stiff. You have a back issue. It's a serious thing, and it just sucks that such a young guy who's maybe was maybe on the cusp of beginning his 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 big league career is now he's never going to play again. Yeah, it's it's a shame. I mean, back injuries they can they can aggravate other parts of your body too. Like everything's connected to your spine in some way. Yeah. So you know, a shame to see that, but but Johnny, we wish you well. Uh, the Orioles tendered contracts for twenty twenty three to all six of their arbitration eligible players. Outfielders Austin Hayes, Cedric Mullins, Anthony Santander, shortstop Jorge Mateo, right-handed pitchers Dylan Tate and Austin both. Those are all no-brainers to me, Paul. Does yeah. Anything surprise you there? There was question about Austin both because of the money that he was going to command and how he hadn't really been effective until he got to the Orioles in his career, uh, save for like nine nine starts like five years ago with, with um, Washington. But uh, what he did in over 80 innings, uh, what was it, a 2.82 or 2.28 ERA? With a t- I think it was like a 2.83 ERA. It was it was under 2.9. I don't know the yeah. exact number, but it was low. Um, for two million bucks, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna extend him in offer. The fact that it was a question for anybody um, kind of blew my mind. That that's a guy with the elite spin rate on his fastball and his curveball developing. I think it's like a like a they call it a, <laughs> for lack of a better term, they call it a slutter. Uh, a slide cutter, <laughs> uh, a slider cutter pitch. Um, I'm interested to see how he's what he's going to do, and I'm I, I'm not surprised that they extended a, a contract to him. Not me neither. I, I I think those are all pretty easy decisions to make. The only player, Paul, under under contract, under like with a, an actual number. Obviously, we have a lot of guys who are going to play for the team next year. The only player with a finite number tied to his 2023 contract is John Means. He's mm-hmm. going to make just under three million next year. Uh, you mentioned what what Austin Voth is projected to make. In arbitration, MLB trade rumors has Anthony Santander at seven point five million, Cedric Mullins at four point four, Hayes at three point one, Austin both at two million, Mateo at one point eight, Dylan Tate at one point five. And when, when you look through those names, the most interesting case to me is Austin Hayes. We were talking about him as a potential All Star in May of this year, and then he completely fell off a cliff. From twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two, his walk rate and his strikeout rate both improved really, really slightly, but all of his batted ball metrics got um, pretty substantially worse. And maybe he was playing hurt. He got banged up a decent amount of times, got his hand stepped on, had, got hit in the elbow a few times or the wrist. Um, and and that kind of makes me want to give him the benefit of the doubt. But at the same time, he's going to be 28 in July. We, we haven't seen, I don't think, enough from him to show that he's going to be worth a $3.1 million figure. I, I'm I'm not sure he's he's worth that, especially when you consider the other outfield talent. And and we've we can we've talked about this a lot, you know, on this show and, and a lot of other shows have, and it's been a hot button topic on Twitter. What do we, what do you do with Austin Hayes if if you're the Orioles? Because I I don't know. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm looking at his numbers right now, and he went and look. This is all the first two years of unlimited playing time, 21 games. 2019, 309, 373, 574, 947. Uh, 2020 in 20 in uh, 33 games, 279, 328, 393, 722. Uh, 2021 in 131 games, he had a 308 on base percentage, uh, and in 2022 in 145 games, he had a 306 on base percentage. His numbers have steadily gone down each year, um, and that just kind of comes with getting more playing time. That you're like. If you start hot like he did in those 21 games in 2019, um, the, the number is going to look really good. And then you have a truncated season in 2020, and you missed half of that with an injury. The number is going to look good too. But then when you start playing more and more games, the batting average comes down below 260. The on-base percentage comes down below 310. And to me, I don't care that it's $3 million. $3 million in, in the grand scheme of things, that's that's chump change, right? It's, right. Yeah. This is a guy that you're probably projecting to be a starter on your team. And when he's good, he's really good, right? But when he's not good, he's not good. And we saw that for longer this past season than we saw the good from Austin Hayes. And maybe he was banged up, but then that's the other problem, is that he's been banged up his entire career. And while he's played right. 
131 games and 145 in back-to-back years. He still never played 150 games in the season. He's 28 years old. He can't seem to stay healthy. And the one year where you felt like he did stay healthy, he probably didn't because he was batting. He, he was playing through um, bruises and injuries, and aches and pains, and the numbers just weren't there. I mean, his July through September was some of the worst stats I've ever seen. Some of the worst performance I've ever seen from an everyday player. Uh, I, I, I like Austin Hayes. I don't trust him. I can't trust him to play every day and post up and be the player that we saw April through June in 2022. I would much rather... He's not going to want to be a fourth outfielder. So I would much rather see him as part of a trade or honestly released in favor of somebody that I, that can come in and swing the bat every day and stay healthy and play good defense. The, the the only issues I have with that is you you trade him now it's it's at his lowest value. He's he's not going to be worth a ton in a trade. And you release him then you you risk a situation where he goes to a different team and and figures it out. And like I said this is a guy we were talking about as an all-star this this past season. Um you know un, until he started scuffling and granted it was a, a long-term bad bad scuffle but it's, I don't know. I like it, it. It's easy to say I don't think he should be an opening day starter for the Orioles this upcoming season, but I also I feel like it's it's risky. I don't know. I, I like him too, and I, I think that's the only reason I feel this way. Well, yeah, I, I it's, it's tough, man. Okay, let's say that he does leave, and then he has a really good year. I mean. That happens. I, I'm not going to be upset about that. I'm not going to be like, oh, they should have kept him because nothing he did made him worth keeping. That's true. You know, and, and say you do you, the the reverse of that. Say you do keep him and he does it again. What what he did last year, where he just can't he can't hit for three months. To me, it's you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, right? So, yeah. I, and, and what I look at with the Orioles is they're not going to release him and not have a replacement for him. Right. I, I'm interested to see what Kyle Stowers can do. I'm interested to see what Colton Kowser can do. I'm interested to see if they go out and sign, I don't know, Brandon Nimmo. And I don't think they're going to sign Brandon Nimmo, but I don't see why the hell not. I don't know why you wouldn't sign a guy that can play good defense and get on base of the 370 clip. I, I don't I don't get why he's suddenly out of the Orioles price range. He's going to cost, what, $18 million a year? I would yeah, be knocking down the door. So, oh, yeah. So to me, I would much rather see who's going to replace him because they're not just going to get rid of Austin Hayes just to get rid of him. You know, right. so I, 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 if he goes elsewhere and he has a good year, I'll be happy for him. I'm not going to lament it at all. No, me too. Yeah. Because then you run the risk. Like you said, he, he comes back for another season and he struggles the way he did last year. And then he's holding back a team that's supposed to be in contention for, for a playoff spot. And, and obviously we don't want to see that. Now uh, let's look ahead a little bit, Paul, because in my opinion, this is the time to supplement the Orioles roster with proven major league talent. You've got a, a team full of guys in arbitration, pre-arbitration and on otherwise team friendly deals. And I, I think, I think it's time. It's kind of like, you know, Lamar being on his rookie deal deal with, with the Ravens. Why have they not supplemented the offense with talented wide receivers for him to help spread the offense and throw the football? It doesn't make sense. The Orioles, I think need to learn from that and not make the same mistake because looking ahead, the Orioles have no notable free agents after next season. Mm-hmm. 2024 free agents, there's nobody uh, of note. I think like Engelby Vielmo was on the list. I, I don't know why. Uh, 2025, the only two uh, big names that are will be free agents are John Means and Anthony Santander. 2026, you've got Mullins, Hayes, Mateo, Dylan Tate, and Austin Voth. So that knocks out all the arbitration-eligible guys that we saw get tendered this year. 20, 2027, you've got Mountcastle, Ramona Rios, Tyler Wells, CNL Perez, and Keegan Aiken. Everyone, everyone else is 2028 and beyond. Mm-hmm. So you've got a roster full of guys who are cheap, who are talented, but cheap. And I think they need to go out and and really make a splash. And to be honest, Paul, we, you know, we, we talk about liftoff, but I haven't seen a lot of signs that point to the Orioles spending a ton of money. I think they will make moves. I think they will make a fair amount of moves, but how much is, I think, the jury's still out. We've heard that they're kind of like the dark horse, that they've been talking with everybody. Um, I don't know what everybody entails. I don't think they've been talking to Aaron Judge. I don't think they've talked. Maybe maybe they've put in a token phone call to Trey Turner's or Carlos Correa's representatives. I I don't know. I, I think that... 
we have PTSD as Orioles fans. So we don't expect them to go out there and shop at the top of the free agent shopping list. Uh, we expect them to maybe go after Chris Bassett or Michael Brantley or Josh Bell. Um, I don't know, man. I, I like the time but, is the time is now. Like you're not going to have better fl- payroll flexibility than you have right now. I don't understand not not signing somebody, but I also I don't know. I, I look at it like who are the free agent pitchers out there that you could sign, right? Everybody's talking about Chris Bassett. He's 33 years old. Everybody's talking about Justin Verlander, 38, 39. Um, Degrom's 35. You, those are the guys that uh, Rodon is 31, I believe. And I think so. Um, so all these I guys, think are, on the wrong side of 30, yeah, all these guys, Taiwan are Walker, the, the wrong side of 30. Now, look, I, I'd love to have them here. I'm not saying don't sign them because they're on the wrong side of 30. Uh, but what I'm saying is they, I don't understand not spending the kind of money. No, I, right. I don't understand not, not spending the money to go out and get somebody that's talented. You're going to have a bunch of guys that are coming up through your system who you can supplement the talent with. Um, I guess what I, what I was saying before is that the, the, the argument against it is that all these guys are in their 30s and you have guys who might turn into those guys that you can have on the cheap. I just, at the end of the day, you got you got to add to your to your staff. I don't really, if they don't get Verlander, if they don't get DeGrom, if they don't get Rodon, I don't really care about that because I never expected them to anyway. Now, if they miss out on guys like Bassett or, I don't know, insert middling bat free agent here, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be upset because... What are we doing then? What does liftoff actually mean? I feel like I just ranted and rambled, and I had no, <laughs> I had no concise point because I lost my train of thought mid sentence. Because, dude, I'm so tired. I'm dude, so it, tired it's right now. it's tough because we we have no idea. Like this is all everything we're gonna say here is a guess of what might happen. We have no idea. Yeah, we um, like I said, we all have PTSD from like Dan Duquette and Sid Thrift and all and all those guys in the past. We have no idea what liftoff looks like. Now, Mike Elias, he's like, oh, it's liftoff from here. We're going to be big spenders in free agency. And then he says, we're not going to go from zero to 60, <clears throat> from zero to 60 in one off season. Well, then what the hell does liftoff mean to you? Exactly. Because liftoff, you're talking about a rocket, right? So what rocket like takes off and, and sputters? Right. right. And, and we don't even know what it means by, you know, the Orioles are, are touching base with all these people. You know, they're, they're doing their due diligence and reaching out to agents for just about everybody. But does that mean calling an agent and saying, hey, we want to sign your guy? Or does it mean calling an agent and saying, hey, what's this guy going to cost? You know, that's, I think there's a big difference there when, when it right. comes to touching base with these guys. Is it a, a legitimate <clears throat> pursuit of a free agent or is it? you know, hey, what's what's this going to run us or should we look elsewhere? Right now, and I posted on Twitter, I think it was yesterday, that Mike Elias has acknowledged that they need a legitimate middle-of-the-order bat, but they're out on all the shortstops. They're supposedly out on Judge, supposedly out on Nimmo. So what legitimate bat are you going after? It's right. Josh Bell and Michael Brantley. I like Josh Bell. I, I wasn't I- impressed with him in San Diego or in the postseason. But he's a guy who doesn't strike out a lot. Hits for power from both sides. He's only a couple years removed from a 37 home or 119 RBI season. And he had a really good first half, first two-thirds of the season with the Nationals this year. A really, really good first yeah, half. Yeah, so when I, I look at Josh Bell, I wouldn't hate that move. I still think J.D. Martinez is a huge fit here uh, because he kind of has that – right. he's a right-handed hitter, but it has that left-handed hitter profile because um, he, he goes oppo and center so much. I just – look, if you're not in on the big, big bats and you are acknowledging you need a middle-of-the-order threat, who's that threat? Who is it? Right. Because Abreu signed with Houston, and that was the number one guy that I thought they should go after, and I don't even know if they talked to him. So then who the hell is it? Right. Now, I, I was going to bring this up because I was I was big on Josh Bell. I, I have been for a while. You and Luke kind of talked me into Jose Abreu as that that alternative for, for first base DH. Mm-hmm. I'm still I'm still in on Josh Bell. Like you said, he had a really rough time in San Diego. Did not hit well down the stretch. Did not hit well in the postseason. But we we saw him have a, a massive slump and still put up an OBP in the I think it was in the 330 range, which is good by Orioles standards. Yeah, we don't have a lot of guys who who hit that mark. Team. Second on. Yeah, and and this was with his and that yeah, and this was his worst baseball. And and so I, I think I think you need a guy like that to to put in the heart of the order and make a splash. Now, Abreu got, what, three years, 
thirty something million. It was three. It was three years, fifty eight million. Fifty eight million. Wow, mm-hmm. I lowballed that one. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean that's a lot of money for a thirty six year old first baseman. Would you have gone that far if to, to get him if you were the Orioles? <sighs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're gonna have to, right? Uh, I think you, be, I think be, you do have to be, if you want a player you, of that caliber. You want a player of that caliber. You're trying to get into it. There's other teams knocking on the door, and like the number went that high because he had a lot of suitors. Like, apparently, he was number one ta- target for the. I almost said tag it. Like I was from Boston. He was number <laughs> one uh, uh, target for the Boston Red Sox. They contacted him the day free agency began after the World Series. Um, so I think that the number got jacked up because he had a number of suitors. If that's a going rate for a guy who you can put in the middle of your order and maybe the power's down, maybe he won't hit 30 home runs because of that wall in left field, but he can still hit over 300, drive the ball into the gaps and drive in runs. Uh, yeah, I, I would have I would have given him that money. I would have given him three years, 58 million, 100%. It's not my money, so. <laughs> that's that's true. It's easy to, easy, easy to say yes when it's not your wallet you have to open. Right. I want to talk about the relief pitcher market because the, the guys who were, in my opinion, the top three, uh, Edwin Diaz, Rafael Montero, who's the guy I really wanted, and uh, Robert Suarez of the Padres, they all re-signed with their respective teams. The market at relief pitchers is, is pretty thin. And I, you've you've mentioned guys like Adam Adovino as as potential fits. I'm, I'm almost at the point, Paul, where I kind of think the Orioles should focus elsewhere, leave the bullpen as is, and play the waiver game. Because especially as it comes to relief pitchers, Elias has been pretty damn good at, at picking up guys who make an impact. Now, is that a risky move? Has he, though? Has he? Austin, Austin Voth, CNL Perez. I mean, he's been pretty other, good. Brian he, Baker. He was good for one season. For, for That's one, true. For one season. How, how, like, I mean, the previous three years, I mean, their bullpen was historically terrible. Historically terrible. So, yeah, he, 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 got, he got Baker and he got Perez and, it was, and he got both. Um, I mean, maybe it's a tribute to more so Chris Holt than it is to Mike Elias. But yeah, yeah. I should I'm I not, should give the credit there. I, I, I'm not going to say that he's really great at something that he's only done once, right? So that's fair. T- t- so to me, it's I don't want to go down that road. I don't I don't want to like like look. You're now on the other side of this thing. You're supposed to be on the other side of the rebuild, right? So why are we going to play around with our bullpen? Your bullpen's got to pitch every single day. Why are you going to play around with it and not sign legitimate pitchers and, and and take a flyer on some guy who may or may not be good? I don't want to do that. They're going to do that, but I, I don't I don't like running the baseball team that way. Go out and sign a legitimate reliever that you know is going to get the job done. That's why I want Otavino. That's why I want Daniel Robertson. Um, or David is it, it's David Robertson. That's why why right? Yeah, Daniel I think was the third baseman or yeah. infielder somewhere. Yeah, David's why- the pitcher. That's why I want David Robertson and Otavino because those are guys who have proven track records and they maybe fell off a little bit, but they came back and both had really nice seasons last year. And they're veteran pitchers that can lead a young staff and show the, show a young bullpen how to do the job day in and day out 162 games out of the year. So the waiver stuff, I'm not here for it. But I, even though I know it's going to happen, I'm not here for it. That's, that's fair. I, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say in response to my next question uh, based on your answer to the previous one. But um, – what what about a guy like an Alex Reyes? He uh, had to get a shoulder reconstruction last year, missed the season, um, had had a, to repair his labrum. But he was an All Star in 2021. He he's in the past he was ranked as high as second on, on Baseball America's prospect list. The injuries, like I mentioned, are a concern. He's he hasn't been able to stay healthy much. The walks are a concern as well. But everything else about his profile is really really good. Is he a guy who is worth taking a flyer on, or do you want someone who's more established, has a better injury track record, and is more of a veteran presence? Look, if if he's healthy, yeah, I I want to I want to take a shot on him. I want I want to take a shot on the guy that I know is going to get the job done. So, like I just said, so yeah, I, I'd be all for Alex Reyes, but he's going to have to pass that Orioles physical, which we know how difficult that is. And if he does, then if he can pass the Orioles physical, then he deserves a shot, you know, but it's, it's getting past that physical and proving that he's healthy and can stay healthy for an entire year. If he can come in and help the Orioles bullpen, I, I want guys who can help the Orioles bullpen. So Alex Re- Re- Reyes, that's a, uh, that pro- he profiles is that if he, if he can stay healthy. Fair enough. All right. 
a couple more things I want to talk about. Uh, sure. Orioles minor league. So this this actually happened the day after our last episode. A bunch of minor leaguers elected free agency. I teased this a little earlier in the show. I mentioned Brett Cumberland and Jacob Nottingham. Uh, the other catcher, Andres Angulo. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, right-handed pitchers, Rico Garcia, Lewis Head, Matt Harvey, Brennan Hanafi. Left-handed pitcher, Alexander Wells, who seems like he's been in the organization for the last 15 years. Infielder, Chris Given. Outfielders, you Neil Diaz and DJ Stewart all have elected free agency. Do you lose sleep over any of these? Because uh, personally, I don't. Not a one. Not a one. I mean, we, we saw the writing on the wall with a few Neil Diaz. I think we said on our last show, he could be somebody who doesn't make it too far into the offseason. And then literally the next day, he <laughs> the next was, day he was gone. D, he was DFA'd. Um, Alexander Wells, I don't know that he's ever going to have a career. He's just such a soft tosser. And then the one thing that he had in his back pocket was being able to throw strikes, and he gets to the big league level and he couldn't throw strikes. Uh, Matt Harvey. Matt Harvey surprised me because the Orioles were willing to give him a shot after all that crap that he went through with the Tyler Skaggs ordeal. Yeah. And I don't know what other team's going to give him a shot. You know, I, I, like I don't know what team is going gonna, is gonna to want to deal with that. So I was surprised that he that he decided to leave the organization. But I think everybody else, don't let the door hit you with a good Lord split you. <laughs> Yeah, we, we we were texting about Diaz the day after our show because it was it was first announced that he was outrighted to Norfolk and accepted mm-hmm. that assignment. Uh, but then a few hours later, oh, no, he elected free agency. So UCL Diaz is no longer the Orioles' problem. Neither is DJ Stewart, thank goodness. I was oh, I thought that he had a future as a tire- first baseman. I, I was tired of being terrified that Stewart was going to get called up instead of Kyle Stowers last year or, or mm-hmm. Colton Cowser this year. And so I'm, oh, I'm glad do you we think don't he have to worry the about bench that. as much as Kyle Stowers did. No, he would have played every day. Yeah, he, I'm gonna call DJ Stewart to ride the bench. <laughs> All right, uh, last last topic for this evening. I'm surprised we made it over a half an hour because there really hasn't been much going on. What do you want to see by the time the winter meetings are over? They happen next week. Your co-host on the bat around Zach will be there. I actually owe him a text because he texted me yesterday to ask for some advice since I went to the meetings a few years ago. What do you want the Orioles to do? If they, if they make one move by the time the winter meetings are over, what should it be? One move? Well, you can give me more. Um, I just wanted to narrow it down a little bit. Chris Bassett, Jameson Tyon, and trade for Mike Trout. No, not, not trade. <laughs> uh, that, I, I, keep, I keep thinking maybe they'll trade for Mike Trout. Like, I don't actually believe that, but like... I mean, I don't... They- not want that to happen but like how how are they going to address the middle of the order uh, so for me it's legitimately like let's go out and get two starting pitchers that, like you wanted to do if you get if they come away from the winter meetings or this off season in general with bassett and tyon um i'm let's go let's go uh birdland let's fly um <laughs> <laughs> but uh and then uh, they need a bat they absolutely need a bat. I don't know who that bat is. If, if they get Josh Bell, they get Josh Bell. If it's Michael Brantley, it's Michael Brantley. <clears throat> you got to keep him healthy too. Um, they need a legitimate bat, a legitimate bat. I'm so glad Carlos Santana already signed with Pittsburgh. Um, oh, me too. The, like people were talking about him, like, <clears throat> oh, let's let, let's sign Santana. Like, hasn't been good in five years. Uh, like he hits like 202. Let's just sign Ruth Nitto Door again. Go out and please, please. Please get a middle of the order bat that's not some uh, or something that you already have. And when I say that, I mean like a guy who has a lot of power, but also swings it. You don't have to throw him a strike to get him out because they have like three or four of those guys already. Now it, it would not surprise me, Paul, to come out of next week and the Orioles have not made an actual signing or trade. Oh, that's one hundred percent what I'm expecting. I think we'll have a much better idea. I toast. Uh, we'll have a much better idea of who they're going after and what specifically they want to do, where specifically they want to upgrade. Excuse me. I think we'll have a much better feel for that coming out of next week. Yeah, they're going to be linked to a lot of players. It, it, that's going to happen. Um, I expect nothing. I expect the winter meetings to come and go and have the Orioles have not done anything. So I'm, Except honestly, take two guys in the Rule 5 draft. Oh, my God. <laughs> can we finally get to a point where we're not doing that anymore i feel like we should be at that point now but I, I, anyway um yeah I, I guess what i'm hoping at the end of the day is that they do something like because i've been so i've been excited for five six weeks and th- nothing's happened 
Right. Well, speaking of nothing happening, we we expect that to. Well, the problem with hosting a podcast in the off season is that there's not much going on. So we're definitely not doing weekly anymore. We switched to bi-weekly. It's been three weeks since our last episode because of Thanksgiving. But I think this Orioles podcast feud is going to help the offseason go by much quicker. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it should take us just about up to spring training uh, is my expectation, depending on you know how quickly I can get people to, to come in for the matchups. But in any event, I, I think it's going to help the offseason fly by. It's going to be a lot of fun. And as things happen throughout the offseason, Paul and I, or Paul or myself, will hop on and, and give a reaction, and you know we'll we'll try to keep you informed with what's going on and, and how we feel about certain things. But until then, there's only so much brainstorming we can do. You know, there, there's not a whole lot to talk about. You know, we're not gonna we're not we're not gonna break down every little waiver claim that happens and try to figure out who they might sign when. We've been talking about that for the last month already, and and nothing's happened. So we'll, we'll report the news as we get it, but give that fan a podcast throughout the off season. Will be these these tournament matchups between other podcasts, and I'm I'm pumped about it. Yeah, no, I'm I'm excited for that. You want to talk about difficult? The bat around doesn't get any breaks except for holidays. So we do a two hour show every Saturday of the off season. Um, this is the third year, my yeah, third year, my third year doing it, and. Um, we get through, we manage to do it. We have trivia, we have some fun with it. You know, um, it's a lot of the same questions until they sign somebody and it's a lot of what's next season going to look like. And the off season still manages somehow to go by pretty quickly. Despite that, you want to talk about difficult though. No Saturdays off last year during a three month lockout. You want to talk about difficult? Yeah. That sucked. It sounds that like sucked. Hell. We had, we had nothing to talk about. It was like every guest, we were just like, so think the lockout's going to end. <laughs> yeah, me too. I just don't know when, how many games you think you're going to play. Yeah. I don't know. Why can't they just meet in the middle? I don't know. That was literally every show, literally did, every show. Did you maintain viewership or did it kind of dip for a while? Um, I think people tuned in anyway, because they were, they were just starved for baseball. You know, pe- people tuned in because they, they wanted to hear baseball. Maybe like maybe something happens, or we we know something that they don't. So people still tuned in, and we we and again we still had fun with it. It just when nothing's happening, it's and the other thing is that we had we would have guests on that um like I I, I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, but he was uh, Evan Evan Drellich. Uh, we would have a guy like Evan Drellich on who was like right in the thick of things and always reporting on it. And he would, we'd have a guy like him on to talk about things and what, how are things progressing, what the big sticking points are and stuff like that. So we managed to make it topic. Uh, um, we managed to make it um, relevant and noteworthy, but it was, it was hard, man. It was probably the hardest reporting I've ever done. Which is exactly why I decided to, Host the tournament. <laughs> it's it's actually an idea that, that Josh from Section 336 gave me uh, a couple years ago. It never actually came to fruition, uh, but they'll be participating. I'm not going to reveal all the all the guests yet. I will reveal the bracket once I have that sorted out. That'll be on our Twitter at Give That Fan a Pod. Uh, I'll show the bracket once I have the first round matchups finalized, and uh, we'll we'll get the show on the road. But like I said, we'll we'll do little episodes here and there when things actually happen, and Paul and I will coordinate that. But until then, you can expect this show to be Orioles Podcast Feud, and I hope you all tune in, and I hope you follow along and, and, and watch it at home. You don't have to watch live. You can go back and watch the videos later. The audio editions will be available on our Spotify, Apple, Google, as they always are, as well as Utah Street Report. But we hope that it's enjoyable because I don't know about you, Paul, but I like sitting at home and watching Family Feud, and this is exactly that, except it's all Orioles-related. So I really think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, Family Feud. Are you a Family fun, Feud guy? Watched it. I haven't watched it in so long. I'm, I'm telling you, the last time I watched a full episode of Family Feud, the the host that killed himself was still the host. Really? You didn't know that there was a. I didn't, didn't know there was a host that killed himself. No, I did not. Um, look. I know. Up. I know. I know Richard Dawson. Yeah. He was like way back in the day. I know. Uh, who's the dude from uh, Home Improvement? With Tim Allen? Um, I know the guy who plays Al. Al, yeah. He was he hosted it for a while. Steve Harvey does it now. By the way, should I should I grow a mustache? 
to host yeah. it. I mean, you have a mustache. You already have. Yeah, one. but I also have. A, like, should I should I get rid of the beard and leave just the mustache? I mean, let, let let me put it to you this way: my first date with my wife was um, I had a mustache. Uh, and, I ma- and- I matched with my fiance on Bumble because I had a picture of me with a mustache. And rock the mustache. We both got our women. There, there might we be. both got our women with mustaches. So <laughs> there, there might be something to say about it. Um, I, hang on a second. I, I got to look up Richard Dawson. Are you trying to figure out the the Family Feud host? Yeah, because th- there was a guy in between who did it in the late eighties, early nineties, and this guy killed him. I I I know I would recognize him because I've I've seen all the old clips, but I I did um, not know that that was a thing that had happened. Yeah, it one hundred. Let's see, it was Ray Combs. Ray Combs. He died June second, nineteen ninety six. Um, hang on, death. Back, oh Back, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ray Combs, that guy. Wow. So I did not know la- that. That's that, how he died. That was the last time I actively. Wa- I like I've seen bits and pieces here and there, but the last time I sat down and watched an entire episode of Family Feud. Ray Combs was still the host. Wow. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, that's... He hung wow. himself. He hanged himself. To get dark here that's on crazy. Give That Fan a Podcast. Yeah, goodness. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was the last time I watched it. I actively watched Family Feud was when Ray Combs was hosting. I guess I could have just left it at that. I just didn't know his name. I just knew him as the host that killed himself. You're aging yourself a little bit there. Uh, no, I, I think it's fun. It, it's one of those things I'll put on if, what, if what, I'm like what? flipping around. There's Ray no. Ray Combs killed himself? Huh? You think it's fun? No. Wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> just... Ryan, what the hell? Well, <laughs> watching, watching the show is fun. I, I'll put it on if I'm like scrolling around. There's no sports I want to watch. Mm-hmm. Family Feud is my go to if it's on. Uh, actually, that's not true. Impractical Jokers is my go to, but Family Feud if it's like Impractical the Carbonaro Jokers. effect or something. Every episode is the same for Impractical Jokers. They're all the same, and they're all totally scripted at this point. There's no, no way people I don't, I don't recognize think so. these. There's no way that people don't recognize these dudes anymore. There's just no way. You'd be surprised, man. No, I, like, I, I wouldn't. I, they, they, I think they, they're, there's a they have a, a big contingent of fans, but I mean, I, they've got security around all the shoots. Like, if anybody looks like they recognize them, they say, "Hey, we're we're filming. Back off." And I, I really think like you'd be surprised how many people, you know, ask, you know, ask anybody famous. I think they'll tell you that while, yes, they do get recognized. There's a lot of people who just walk right by and have no idea. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I don't know. I, I want to believe that it's not scripted because I, I love the show so much. But and they, they are scripted. They are repeating bits at this point, too. Yeah. But man, I, I don't know. It, it gets a laugh out of me most of the time. Didn't one of those guys leave the show? Yeah, Joe. Yeah, why did he leave? He, uh, I think to kind of pursue a, a little bit of a solo career, uh, raising kids, got a wife. Uh, I don't think the other three are married. One Way of, to break up the band, yeah. Yoko. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was my favorite one, too. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, we're, we're getting a little off topic here. Uh, yeah. Orioles, Orioles podcast feud. Uh, I will be the host. I am alive and well for now. And... Uh, God, for, <laughs> for a long time for now. All right. All right. Thank you, as always, to Derek and Tony at Utah Street Report for hosting the pod. I'm going to get myself in trouble. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Please subscribe to our YouTube, youtube.com slash at give that fan a podcast. And keep an eye out at the conclusion of the winter meetings for the debut of Orioles Podcast Feud, featuring your favorite Orioles podcasts coming together in a trivia style tournament. We're very excited. It's not a prediction. It's a spoiler. You're looking at the champion. I, I don't think champion. I don't think I can. I, like I think I have to try to rig the game so that you don't win. You better. You better don't. You better Cause don't. Because then, then people are gonna call call collusion. And I showed you the. Tra- I've been very careful to not show these questions to anybody who's gonna be participating. I have no idea what the questions are. I just have it's, a lot of confidence in myself, but I'm also trying to put on a brave front because I am nervous that somebody's gonna know way more than me. I, not, that's not going to sit well with your boy. I think there will be some questions that stump you. I really do. Uh, probably. I don't. I don't. I don't know who played first base for the nineteen 
73 Baltimore Orioles. I don't know that. I was like that might hurt you, Paul. Get the hell out that, but no, legitimately, that might hurt. If you don't know who played first base for the 73 Orioles, that might come back to bite you. Still in the boot, ass. pal. I don't know. No. I don't. I don't know who it was in '73, but you're you're gonna need to know a little bit from that era. I know. I know enough. I think. I think you do. I think I All right. Enough. We will see everybody next time, probably two weeks from now, unless the Orioles make a signing or a trade or something during the winter meetings. We'll come on and and do do an episode about that. But otherwise, keep an eye out for the debut of Orioles podcast feud. We'll see you next time on Give That Fan a Podcast. <laughs>